my uh, rain song, Zeppelin. I can do some other Zeppelin for you. Oh, thank you so thank much. You. Yeah, Zeppelin. I want to learn Night Flight. Friends, it is James Calm, your half-assed reporter, the guy on the bike. And we are here on Orchard Street on the Lower East Side. We're gonna try to slip in there to Mackenzie Fine Arts. And we're gonna try to get some pictures of an exhibition. How do you pronounce Rob's last name? Ode? Da Auda. <laughs> Rob Da Auda. Okay, thank you. Rob Da Auda. <laughs> okay. Uh, Title Echo 2022. This is 24 by 24 inches. Now, I've probably known Rob and have been seeing his work for 20 years, 18 years, something like that. And uh, Rob used to have a studio out at, uh, was it? 2121 Troutman Street, something like that, 1919 Troutman Street. This is titled Tailspin 2022. It's oil on canvas. I came in for the opening, I guess it was two weeks ago, something like that, two and a half weeks ago. And, uh, well, it was crowded and there were a lot of people and a lot of yakking, so I thought I would come back when I could at least hear myself yap. So I finally made it back today. Okay, so I was just talking to Valerie a little bit about the show, and she was commenting that uh, she thinks Rob has made a breakthrough. And one of the things that uh, I think she was picking up on is this sense of the luminosity and, uh, well, we can talk a little bit about that as we go down here. As I said, I've known Rob for a while. I went in and visited his studio during some of the Bushwick Open Studio things. Okay, so we're just going to run down these. These are all 12 by 12, some of the smaller pieces. And, uh, well, she said Rob is of Dutch heritage. And so in that way, I wanted to come in and uh, take a look at this in relationship to some of the, of the other formalist abstractions that we've been looking at. People like Rico Gaston and uh, Regina Bogot, some other people. And uh, Rob has a pretty inter interesting technical approach I've stopped in and watched him at the studio. He's got a uh, a framework that he kind of lays his panels in and around the edges of the the painting in the frame is a bunch of little holes that he can move pegs that he rests his guide stick, his molly stick, his, his ruler around and he can do extremely fine work. So another aspect about using the, the frame and little notches is that Rob can also kind of skew that. He can kind of uh, 
put the guide stick in the, the wrong notch and kind of twist this and give you some, uh, some angles in there instead of, instead of everything being horizontal and vertical. It's kind of fun and throws an extra monkey wrench into the works. Stuntle duo. And, uh, well, here we get a chance to see the the glow, the illumination. We can get up and see if we can get some examples of the brush strokes. Okay, I don't know exactly what his process is, but I would assume that he probably tries to uh, run out each one of these strokes in one shot. I'm thinking maybe, maybe not. And he's not using tape, so he's got to have very uh, well-shaped brushes, very uh, pristine instruments that he's working with here. And there's also kind of a uh, an op art aspect of the looking at the way the forms kind of bulge in the middle. It's titled Matchup 2022. It's 12 by 12. Oh, and uh, gosh, look at that. We got some red dots on the price list. That's a good sign. I think also Rob is um, probably has a pretty sophisticated color theory. You know, there are various approaches to color. There's tonality. There's spectral colors, earth tones, things like that. And I think that uh, one of the reasons that Rob's paintings do have a certain luminosity is because he's been able to uh, use those optic principles This is Fever Pitch, 20 by 24. I think also uh, there's a, a resurgence of interest in formalistic abstraction, more formal abstraction. Uh, this was 2012, Walter Robinson came out and coined the term zombie formalism. There were a whole group of young painters that kind of got classified in that category. And, uh, well, after a year or two, they kind of crashed and burned. Recently, we've kind of been inundated with a, what I, I kind of called a school of zombie figurative pieces. Now you don't, now, now you do, now you don't. This is 12 by 12. Um, so I think people have, well, they're ready for a change and I think that maybe they're looking at formalist abstraction. And when I say formalist in this sense, I would say that it's more dealing with color theory, geometric forms, more conceptual approaches to picture making. I think this is titled Unison. This is 60 by 60. You can also think of these as a uh, almost being woven together like a piece of fabric. Rob has this little loom that he Instead of threads, he's using brush strokes. It's titled In the Balance. 
Well, as I said, I've known Rob for quite a while. I've been looking at the work. We get together and kind of talk about the things that painters talk about. And uh, one of the things that I, I commented to him in this, with this latest body of work was that um, I like the way that he had been uh, broadening out some of the stripes I think that, uh, well, he loves his, like I said, his fine woven fabrics. This is double feature, 24 by 24. But I was thinking that, uh, and this is an example of that, that uh, just from a purely th color theory aspect that, uh, the larger the area of color that you have and the stronger the contrasts are between those areas, the greater impact the color resonance will have. This is titled In the Wings. This is the biggest piece in the show, so this is six by six feet. Do we know how long it takes Rob to do a painting like this? Do you have any idea? A couple of months. Couple of months. So he would be in there probably <laughs> making his strokes for hours on end. Uh, he just kind of run across this. It would be like running across the keys of a piano and seeing the, the various sh shifts in his shades and his tones. different levels. So this is James Com reporting on Rob Dioda. Is that right? <laughs> Unisons here at McKenzie. I think I'm going to uh, gang this up with the Rob Dioda show, a couple of formalist abstract painters, but I think it's always interesting to kind of look at works in contrast to each other, and in a way, uh, Rob and Paul are kind of on uh, opposite ends of a 
spectrum of formalist abstraction. This is titled The Peer 2021. One of the things is that uh, you can see that Paul uses a very stark reductive composition and uh, when we look at some of the other paintings he also has a lot of uh, variations in his paint surfaces. For example, this one is pretty uh, pretty thin, pretty flat, and uh, you know, it looks like it was very spontaneously painted. This is La Nute 2015 oil on linen, 65 by 64. Well, I think one of the other things that people have found attractive about Paul's work is uh, his color. And in a lot of ways, these are not exactly monochrome. But he does basically kind of reduce the palette down to your your background color and then whatever colors it is it's used to create your form. And in Paul's case, the forms are a lot like drawings. We were talking about geometric abstraction, and so there you go, we've got our we got our triangles, circles, squares or near squares. I think that Paul probably does a lot of this fairly freehand and then in the process of uh, building up his paint surface, he kind of refines things down. I was talking to some people about Paul's color and they're also saying, you know, it's a lot of these paintings have got layers and layers of paint on there. But there's also a kind of a sense of some of this is just these weird in-between colors. And there's even a little uh, gradient, a little fades between there, all kind of depending on uh, which way the angle of the brush stroke is going against your, your form. It's a nice heavy cotton duck. That must be a number eight. In the city, 2018. It says here this is oil on linen. <laughs> Looks like cotton duck to me. Well, I was kind of thinking about uh, where I would say Paul's heritage is coming from, and he, he's got a pretty unique uh, vocabulary of forms. I was thinking that uh, just from a compositional standpoint, some of this kind of makes me think of uh, Diebenkorn, except that uh, Paul has kind of even distilled it down beyond that, and so he's just sort of taken something that Diebenkorn has used and has reduced it down to where you just have the skeleton of that. This is titled Mellow Yellow. 76 by 74. Okay, that does make me think of a drip coming down. And again, one of these kind of strange yellows, kind of a dirty chartreuse. Andromeda, 60 by 80. 
Well, I was talking about formalism and what formalism is, and basically you're dealing with line, shape, color, forms, textures, and when you bring it in more into the realm of painting, then you get into all kinds of gnarly questions about brush strokes and drawn lines and other various minutiae that nobody except the paint heads are worrying about. But this is pretty nice with the, uh, the white line kind of reinforcing this blue line, pale blue line. So I sometimes talk about one of the things I like about Chris Martin's work is that um, Chris is someone that always pays a lot of attention to the, the edge. And that's kind of about not only the edge of the canvas, but the edge of the composition. And how do you meld those things together? If you're a painter, you're working on rectangular surfaces, you're gonna, always going to have to deal with the edge. Pasifa, 2020, oil and linen, 65 by 64. Okay, this is this is interesting because this is one of the paintings that uh, Paul is actually filling in the uh, the sections within his drawn structure with various color things. But there's also. Uh, Still that, the structure that kind of holds this out, presses it against the picture plane. Again, are kind of weird greens. Is that an earth green? Is that a Kelly green? Forest green, grass green? <laughs> Is that a mint green, a pistachio green? Mid-noon, 2021, oil on linen, 70 by 70. Again, this is another very reduced down piece. Well, like I said, I came in and saw the opening, and then I thought about this and uh, came back a week or two later. I actually like some of these pieces that have got a lot of the paint on there. And it says that this was 2021, but I would think that Paul probably could be spending years on some of these. And I like the... Uh, I guess what I would call the the licked nubs on some of these edges. And, uh, well, I think there's a, uh, a language, almost a uh, syntax of brush strokes that, you know, there are various codes, various meanings that you can uh, take away from the way that the brush strokes are made and preserved and uh, created. And I think that, to me, adds a lot of interest to these. Also, uh, if you start to work on some of these paintings for years and years and years, the color things start to change. You have a little halo of something coming out from a couple of years ago, and it starts to affect the top layer of paint. Triangles, 2019 oil on linen. Sixty-five by seventy-four. Another example. I think this is actually nice. He's got this triangle here that looks pretty thin, pretty transparent. 
and even the lines look like they're thinly painted or maybe just a one-shot paint job and then you've got uh, this kind of engulfing blue. I guess that would be an ultramarine. Maybe we got it tinted down with something. Oh, and that little stripe there in the middle is more turquoise. Refraction. 2022, this is 61 by 80, oil, well, I'm a simple guy, but I like my geometry, I think I like geometry because it's like mathematics and pictures, so even I can understand that sort of, okay, so we've got a little, uh, little puzzle here. We've kind of left out a matching diagonal stripe there. That's always fun. And again, that uh, some kind of mysterious vaporous green. and thus spoke. <laughs> it's 2020. Well, I've been looking at abstract painting here in New York for a long time. And uh, there was a robust and uh, healthy community of abstract painters and I think a lot of these people kind of, uh, well, they support the tribe and it's always nice to see people that are kind of, uh, well, maybe not directly paying homage to certain things but kind of carrying on the legacy and one of the things I was just kind of getting an echo on here was uh, great artist Gary Steffen, I don't know why. Oh, there are a lot of other people. Okay, I like these little kind of notches painted in there. Okay, there's a lot of stuff underneath that red. I think this one is one of my favorite pieces in the show, partially because it's maybe one of the most distilled pieces in here. But also, I, uh, I appreciate the notion of the, the colored line. I think it was one of the great Italian Renaissance artist that uh, wrote a treatise on, treatise on painting that said that you were either a calori or a disagno. You were either doing with color or drawing. And in a case like this, you can play both sides of the, the coin. So, uh, while I was talking about the mysterious colors and even with the white you know it's not totally white maybe it's because there's a little something that gets mixed in or maybe there's a certain amount of uh, transparency coming through a wash or something Let's go look at the drawings. Okay, well Miguel's got a nice little project room in here. 
perfect for the drawings. I'm not going to uh, give you the titles. It's almost closing time. I think most of these are about 15 by 11. Mixed media. So we're talking ink and pastel on paper, maybe some oil. If you look closely, you can see some of the motifs have been carried over into some of the paintings. Okay, September 11, 2022. Well, I think uh, Miguel also hosted one of Fong Bui's and uh, Kyle McKeever's singing in unison shows here. And, uh, you know, the gallery is big, so it was a fantastic show. Okay, we're not going to give the titles. Actually, I, I saw one of Paul's drawing shows on Orchard Street. This has got to be seven years ago, six years ago, and uh, I was impressed. As I said, it's always interesting to sort of contrast one body of work against another body of work. So we see these works are very spontaneous, very one shot, kind of sitting down, having a cup of coffee, maybe you splash a little of this, make a little drawing. Maybe it sits there for a day or two, you come back and uh, muck it up a little. I like the way the uh, composition seems to have sunk down here to the bottom edge of the picture plane. I think this is a great chance to uh, see how Paul plays off his linear structures here against his more planar coloristic forms. Nice sparse uh, ink wash drawing. James Conn reporting on Paul Pack at Miguel Abreu. You can like this, share, link it up at all your social media sites. You can talk about it in your parties, openings, classrooms, and you can subscribe. And you can leave your thoughts, ideas, comments, criticisms, and reviews below. And we only ask you to say, thank you, Kate. Well, that's a bargain. No, but I play outside, and then dirt gets caught up in the spring, so I try to keep it. <laughs> dirt gets caught up in the spring. Like the thing, no, 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 no. You know what Thank I'm you. Hendrick's got a